Great, now let's take this class one step further and talk about the constructor. You may have noticed that I've used this word construct a few times discussing the creation of a new object of the class, which I'm also calling an instance. So when we construct a new instance, we're talking about a new object that is of that object type. So if I say y equals hello, I just constructed a string int instance. And if I say ii equals 55, I've just constructed an int instance, integer instance. We're using these terms now because these terms are more specific to the concepts of object-oriented programming. Although saying object instead of instance is pretty accurate. It's the same idea. Now we want to say, you know, want to highlight this idea of creating uh, a, one of these um, types. One, a one of, we'll say one of, right? An instance, an instance of this. Like when you say, oh yeah, uh, this is always true. Like for instance, like for instance, this, like you give them a specific uh, uh, example, right? This is an example of a my class object that I assigned to X. It's an instance of the my class class. It's of type my class. And when we create that new uh, object or that new instance, we call it a construction. We construct it. Um, and there's a specific method that can be used to prepare the object or the instance. So far, we've noticed that you don't need a specific method. You can simply call the class and you get the instance, right? And it's of the right type and it responds to methods. But there's a way to explicitly create such an object, and that's through the init constructor. We're going to show first that every time you create an object or an instance, every time you construct an instance, I'm going to try to stay with the more uh, specific terminology, that every time you create such an instance or construct such an instance, it's going to call the init constructor. Now you can see that init, aside from that mysterious self, which we'll talk about shortly, you can see that init doesn't do anything except for print a statement. Let's find out what happens when I construct three new my class instances. I see this statement printed three times. That's because every time we construct a new my class instance, it calls the init constructor if it exists. Every time we construct this my class uh, instance by calling the function, or call, sorry, calling the class as if it were a function, if the init method is there, it will construct. Now, one special caveat for, uh, for you uh, creating init for the first time. To make sure that it works, you need to make sure that you used two underscores on either side of the name. Uh, I've seen many times students will use one underscore uh, and uh, they don't realize that that doesn't qualify. What's strange about it, of course, is that if the init constructor is there, it will get called. And if it's not there, if it's named something similar but not quite the same, then it won't get called. So the presence of init is useful when it's there. <clears throat> but if it's not there, we won't see an error. So we have to make sure to spell it correctly. Double underscore init, double underscore. And of course, init stands for initialization, meaning initialize or create or construct a new object. And you may remember uh, that I've used that word a little bit here and there. Sometimes I say assignment, sometimes I say initialization. And now I'm going to say when we're referring to creating an object, construct. <clears throat> so we know that init gets called automatically every time we construct an object. And by the way, the reason we have double underscores is because we call this a magic method. We're going to get into this 
in much more detail in the next session. But for now, just understand that the double underscore means something that we don't use directly. And I think you can see that we are calling init indirectly. We're not calling it directly, although we could. We're calling it through this uh, special syntax for constructing an object. We're calling it by calling the function, sorry, the, calling, calling the class as if it were a function. Init is being called implicitly. And sometimes we call that magic, meaning you don't, you don't realize it's happening uh, because you don't see it explicitly happening, but it does happen. So that's kind of like magic. So we sometimes call it a magic method. We know that this can get called when we construct an object, but what's it for? What, what can we do with it? Well, I'm going to show you an effect of uh, this happening. I'm going to do something new, and I'd like you to begin by taking a quick look at what I'm doing here. And I'd like you to just stare at this for a few seconds and see what you can try to deduce from what you're seeing. In fact, I would uh, suggest that you pause this video now and take a look at what I've just done and just see what kind of conclusion you can draw. Nothing conclusive, nothing uh, very out of the ordinary, but this is all brand new. And I just want you to notice any relationships that you're seeing between what we're doing on line six and what we're doing on line 12. Okay, so you can see that x dot value is 55. And the only connection that I really wanted you to draw from this is that I'm setting dot value as 55 on line six, and I'm retrieving a value 55 on line 12. So what's going on and what is this dot value thing going on? Well, one thing I want to make sure you understand is that it can be any attribute name that you like, but we're doing something brand new here, something we've never done before. And that is we are setting an attribute in the instance. Now there's a couple of invisible relationships that we're gonna to wanna to connect here to wire this up in our minds. The first is what we just described, which is that when you construct an object as we're doing on line 10, it's gonna call in it. But more importantly, we're actually making use of self now and we're looking and seeing that there looks like to be some kind of relationship between self and X. Self, uh, which was mysterious up until now, is allowing us to set a variable in it. Now we've set variables before. I actually want to point out two different ways that we've set variables, so to speak. Maybe not literally, but um, I want you to look at these two assignments because in both cases we're setting a value to a name. They happen to be a little bit different, but they both are the same in the sense that we're setting a value to a name. The name is A, the value is 5. On line 4, we are setting a value to the name A, variable name A. And we know that later on, if we want to use A, we can. And if we multiply a times two, we know that we're multiplying five times two. Same thing is true with the dictionary. If we wanted to retrieve the value and multiply it, let's say times three, we know that we're multiplying five times three. So I want you to notice this uh, setting of a, a value to a name 
It's different, of course, between a variable name and let's say a dictionary key, but you can see the similarities. It allows us to establish a name that we are then assigning a value to. And because we've established that value at this name, we can retrieve the value from the name. That's the whole point of variables. And it's also the point of dictionaries. Dictionaries allow us to do this, but it's within the context of this one dictionary. The variable is, in a sense, housed within the dictionary. OK, now we're now looking at a third way that we can set a name to a value or a name to an object. And that is something called attribute setting or attribute assignment. Let's say that we're going to assign 550 to the VV attribute in the instance. Now I'm saying instance and I'm implying for you that self is actually the instance. And that is the case. Self is the instance. Self is actually the object. It's the object of my class. Now, how did it get to be called self? And how does this all work? Well, let's just for now understand that self is the instance. <clears throat> and that it's always going to be there because a lot of times with these methods, we're going to want to operate on the instance. The big thing we're seeing though right here is that it's possible to set a variable in the instance. Very much like we were able to set a variable in a dictionary, but similar to the way we were able to set a variable in just our regular variable namespace that is, you know, a equals five. That's a variable key sort of name assigned to an object or an object assigned to a name. And then of course my dict a you can assign an object to that, and that's setting up a name. And this is doing the same thing. We've created a variable named VV, and we're establishing it in the instance. We're saying very much like a dictionary, so similar to a dictionary, that we're saying within this object, here's the key and here's the value. Now, we don't call them key value pairs. We call these attributes dot vv this is an attribute this has been true of every dot thing that we've seen dot upper is actually an attribute dot append is an attribute but we'll get into that a little later what we're doing in this object is we're setting a key value pair and because we've done this we can refer to that same variable name out here with x i'm going to call this something else v is a little maybe a little conf a little uh, too close to home there We can set this key value pair in the instance, and then we can retrieve it from the instance down here. Now, this implies something that I haven't said explicitly, but I hope you're beginning to see. And that is that self is the instance up in the method. Down on line 10 and line 12, x is the instance, right? When we create a new my class instance, and we name it X, we can now say that X is a my class object, or in our new parlance, X is an, a my class instance. Then, up in the method, the instance is not called X. Up in the method, the instance is called self. Now, this will always be the case. You could call it something else. You could call it selfie if you wanted to, but I recommend that you not do that. These variables are always called self, and I don't know if you notice that when you type a method name inside a class, you probably did notice that it pops in self for you. It does that for you because it's expecting that you're going to type that yourself. So it's actually trying to help you by putting the word self in there. Now, just like an argument to a function, because really a method is just a function, but it's a special kind of function. It's a function uh, that is part of a class. Just like any argument to the function, uh, for instance, greet, when I said x.greet uh, David, right? 
And we know that David got copied up to name up here. Um, of course, you know, I could be calling this uh, anything and I could be passing it up as N. But we know that the value that's associated with N is going to be aliased or assigned by reference to the name name, right? In the same way that this whole idea of function values going up to arguments and that the arguments are named whatever we want up here, the same concept is going on down here when we construct the object. Self is the object. It just happens to be called self up here. The object or the instance is being passed to the method. And up in the method, it's called self. It gives us access to the instance that we're working with. It gives us access to any attribute values that are being set in the instance. Now, what's exciting about this is that it allows us to potentially construct a new instance that has values in it already. And you'll hopefully see the similarity to what I'm talking about. Let's pass the value David up to init. And we're going to give that uh, method a second argument. Because as we said, self is always going to be there. And self is the instance. It's a little magical. Like you can't actually see how we're passing the instance, right? When we call my class, you can't see me passing the instance. And when we call greet, you can't see me passing the instance. But it's being passed. That's the thing to understand, that any time we invoke a method of this type, we're passing the instance. In this case, we're passing x. x is a my class object or my class instance. And we are passing that as the first argument to each method that we call. Now, what this is going to allow us to do is initialize the object. There we are back to init. Initialize the instance with a particular value. I'm going to go ahead and take it out of greet and I'm going to make it possible to retrieve that value from the instance through self. And this is the money. This is the money at the end of, of our work. The idea that we can construct an instance and then use methods to populate the instance with values. Populate simply means like give it values. That's what we mean by populate. You know, the instance has certain attributes that it's ready to, to, uh, to, uh, to assign. And we are populating those values within the instance. This is super exciting. And you may not see it right away, but this is super exciting. Sorry, I've got to change my stuff here. There we go. Now we can run it. Let's run it and see. Oops. What did I do wrong here? Ah, self.name. It's called person name. Okay. I think now we're good. Let's try it again. Great. This is the basic mechanics of what we call encapsulation. It allows us to set values inside the instance. The mechanics of doing that are the attribute setting and the attribute retrieval here and here. 
let's run through this and uh, look at it uh, in our minds uh, as we execute. The code begins on line 10, right? Line four through eight, these, this is a definition and it's fine, right? But it's like, a little like defining a function. It doesn't really come into play until we begin to use it. Lines four through eight are just a definition of a class, in a sense, a blueprint for how the object will behave. So the line, the real code, the real action begins on line 10. <clears throat> and in line 10, we're constructing a new my class instance. As we see on the right, when we construct a new my class instance, Python is going to call the init method. And when it does, init will be called, and self is the instance. This is the first appearance of the instance, actually. It begins as an object named self, of, well, it's really a variable named self, that is the my class object. We're also, in our constructor, passing a value, and that value gets assigned to the variable name. Then what we're doing on line six is we are saying, let us set within the instance a key value pair, similar to the way we might in a dictionary. We'll make the name of the attribute person name and the value David. So we're saying that in the instance, person name shall be David. Again, very similar to the way we set a key value pair in a dictionary. So similar, in fact, that later on, if we want to retrieve that same value, we can do it. <clears throat> we can do it up in the method if we want, but we can also do it down here in the calling code. We call this calling code because it's code that makes use of the class. On line 11, we are asking for and we are printing the value for the attribute person name. And it is David because we set it that way in init. So I hope you can see the connection between self and x. Self and x are pointing at the same object. Similar to what we looked at when we looked at references and we saw that when you pass an object to a function, you're passing the object by reference and any new name that points to the object is pointing to the same object x and self both point to a my class instance. In the methods, it's called self. Outside of the methods, we've chosen to call it x. Then when we call greet, we jump up to greet as usual. Self is what? What is self? Self is the instance. Self is the object. And we're then able to retrieve values out of that object, that instance. So consider the implication of this, because this is, it may not be obvious at first blush, but this is an extremely powerful, um, an extremely powerful uh, set of features. Again, we'll see that later as we go forward. It is powerful enough to be able to say this, I can construct an instance with a value and then I can say something, call some sort of method on the instance, and it remembers the value that I set. But if you think about it, we're implementing functionality that we're really familiar with, which may or may not make this uh, powerful or not. <clears throat> you understand that when I am saying zz.upper, I'm not uppercasing just anything, right? I'm uppercasing the string that was constructed. And actually, I guess you can say, and I will just rewrite it as the stir function. You don't need to do this because they give you a shortcut. But the idea is that you call the string, the name of the class, you get back an object. I'm initializing that member of the class, that instance, with a value. That value is stored in the object. We know that because when we call upper, it doesn't uppercase this any string, as I mentioned. It's uppercasing the string that we initialized it with. So now perhaps we start to get a greater and greater appreciation for what an object is. What is an object? Well, one way to describe it is as smart data. That is, 
uh, unit of data with associated functionality, methods. That was the definition that we employed at the very beginning of my introductory class. Smart data, it's a unit of data with associated functionality. And those functionality is known as methods. That's what we've implemented here. In order to understand this implementation, we have to understand all the things that we've covered so far. The first, that when you call the class like a function, it produces a new instance of the class. When you call the class as a function, if init exists, it will call init. Init is just a function. It's a method, but it's also just a function. Inside init, or really anywhere, you can set attribute key value pairs. When we call a method on the instance, it's going to call the method inside the class. And it's going to automatically pass the instance. It'll be called self. And we have access to the instance's attributes from self. So it gives us the chance to create this kind of self-contained little system where we create this instance that can both be something and do something. The thing that it is, is it's a, a my class instance that has a name. And the thing that it can do is it can greet you by its name. And that's the whole idea of using a constructor to initialize an object with key value pairs. Of course, you can do more than one within uh, on an instance of a class. And then our method calls oftentimes make use of those attributes the same way that upper does internally with the string. We're making use of the person name attribute from within greet.